man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. All right. <clears throat> what we do is we find in verses, uh, particularly three and four, but you could say one through four, um, Paul is trying to explain this pattern. He's, he's, he's about to get into it in verses um, five through eight. <clears throat> but <clears throat> he's tried to explain this way in verses one through four based on actions. Uh, be of like mind, let nothing be done through strife. Lowliness of mind, esteem others better, look not every man on his own things, but also on the others, on the things of others. Those are specific actions that he is going to to address his subject that he is set for he is about to really set forth in Philippians. But um, simply to do the actions apart from the attitudes is uh, really not the answer. And, um, and the attitudes are based on this mind. In fact, <clears throat> the proper translation for verse five, let this mind be in you, really the true translation of that, and in many of your Bibles, if you don't have King James, will probably translate it this way. Let this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, see, one sentence, it keeps going. It doesn't say let this, these attitudes be in you that was in Jesus and leave it up to you and I to speculate. By the way, now that we're rolling, happy birthday, Cassie. <laughs> uh, it doesn't leave it up to your mind to speculate about what you think that means. And therefore, to assume that you're <clears throat> lined up with the attitudes of Christ, so he begins with giving us particular actions that he believes is formulated from attitudes, but let's be more specific, attitudes of the crucified one, not just, not just attitudes of Jesus, because that's what he gets into. That's all he describes, not just attitudes of Jesus. Now, I believe, and I believe Paul believed, that every true attitude and action Jesus took was based on a certain spirit and way of proceeding. <clears throat> but as we'll get into, Paul believes that all of that for us, everything that Christ is and everything he ever did is summed up at the cross. Not fulfilled at the cross, but summed up. And we'll, we'll explain that. Um, we're going to give a sort of a new definition of Christ crucified as pertaining to the book of Philippians because he is describing Christ crucified um, in a very specific way and, and we'll point that out as we go. <clears throat> um, so while, while these attitudes are not just you having a certain attitude, it's let this attitude, let this mindset be in you that was in Christ that took him to the cross. And um, he's using verse 1 through 4 as a springboard to 5, 6, 7, and 8 um, 
And he's using the actions described in verse 1 through 4 that he's telling them to have. He's, he's using that as an example and an explanation um, to basically define what he means by Christ crucified. Okay. Now this is, this is important because when we say Christ crucified around here, our minds usually go to one or two particular areas, and Paul is not in those areas in the book of Philippians. He is, he is not going there. He is not addressing that. And to really get that he's, he's going to another aspect of the cross, you have to read it under the power of the Holy Spirit to open your eyes and open your hearts to see that. And so he's, he's setting that forward with these uh, examples and uh, using that as an explanation of Christ crucified. So then in verse, verse 6, verse 5 and 6, um, he, those verses are following up 1 through 4. They are the follow-up to show that what Paul is talking about, and he wants to make sure that these Philippians understand uh, what he's talking about um, uh, and what it is that he's trying to say because he's going to point them to the cross. Okay. How many times have you ever heard that little phrase? Probably hundreds of times. What, I, what Paul means and what I'm saying right now is not in the manner that most people read the book of Philippians, or even deeper life people who seem to know the teachings of uh, Christ crucified, we are getting into to very specific ground here. And um, that's why he's, he, uh, I'm, let's see if I can try to make this clear. He's saying, now, because he's just talking to people, he's writing to them, he's saying, look, I want you to I want you to get along. I want you to defer to one another. I want you to put others first. I want you to not, um, unless there was a wording of that, let nothing be done through strife. Okay. So how much can be done through strife? Well, pretty much everything if you want it to be. <laughs> That's totally up to you, whether you're going to follow the Word of God or, but, but, he says, but, but now consider this almost like he's laying out the truth. And this is the truth, that we should get along and we should defer to one another. And we should uh, not only think about ourselves, but others. And then he says, but that's not really what I'm talking about. And he starts off in verse 5 and 6, particularly starting in verse 6, where he begins to describe Jesus. Jesus. He's, yes, it applies to you. Yes, the only way it can apply to them is through Jesus. And he knows that. So he's not telling them to do, he's not giving them moral precepts. We may take it that way. We may read things like that and try to better ourselves or not be so harsh or not be so critical or not be so, you, you understand what I'm saying? We may, we may grasp hold of the concept with, you know, like the husk of a seed without the germ, without the, 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 the life-giving germ of the seed that breaks through the husk and brings forth life. So. He's not pointing to moral platitudes and saying, this is the way you should act. He's ultimately, he's pointing to the cross and he's pointing to Christ and he's trying to communicate that. Um, but when I say he's pointing to the cross, he's not pointing to another picture of the finished work of the cross. He's not pointing to another picture of the finished work of the cross. He's not. He's not going there. He's not, um, he's not even in the neighborhood of theology. Uh, let's see. Let me 
let me just read one sentence here, or a couple of sentences. But he, that, he, he is not just presenting another picture of the finished work accomplished by that cross. Instead, he points to the cross or to Christ, he points to Christ crucified, not, not the cross in the way that most of us think, therefore, to Christ crucified. He points to Christ crucified as the supreme example of Christian behavior. That's where he's going with that. Um, and Paul is going to show how personal that is in his life in chapter 3 because he's going to literally spell it out in 2 and then in 3 show how his life lines up with what he understands Christ crucified to mean as far as behavior. Um, I wrote uh, in chapter 3 where he explains how the things he does and the things he goes through for God and for others are not the actions of one who is pro-suffering but are explained by the cross. Folks, no wonder people don't understand people like Paul. They will never understand him because they, w they will assume, oh, he's just humble. I mean, if you go by verse 1 through 4, well, he's just humble or he's just, he's just selfless or... Um, um, he's pro-suffering or he's this and that. You'll never get it. You'll never understand those kind of people. You'll read something into it every time because Paul was totally motivated by Christ crucified and it explained all of the junk he went through. It explained, you know, the directions that he took, none of it being random, none of it just being the, the luck of the draw or the bad luck of the draw, literally, knowingly, uh, in fact, I had a, a phrase here, I don't know if I, yeah, ordered. His life was ordered by Christ crucified. Ordered. All right. No, not by the theology. No, I mean, yes, there is the theology. But he's not talking about that here. Thank you, brother. If, if we could define it, how his life was ordered by Christ crucified, Paul's already given us the definitive sentence that will make that clear. He let the same mind and attitudes that took Jesus to the cross to be in him. That's what he did. And that's, that's the explanation of things that seem so, you know, questionable to us because um, the mind of Christ is totally different from everybody else in the world and anybody who ever will be. We can't even be that way except we let what is of him in us. And to try and to, re and to read verse 1 through 4 and try to be good to others and do all of that stuff apart from an invasion of your being by Christ crucified, you're still in charge. You're still the general. You're still the one. Even if, even if you're trying to be humble, even if you're trying to be submissive or a blessing or all that kind of stuff, our goal isn't to get along. Our goal is to be conformed to the image of Christ. I believe that is, and we shared this in one of the last classes, that is the way to unity. Oneness is the way to unity. Because unity comes from the word uni or uni or one. And if that's true, because the basic American concept of unity is not uni, one. It is many, many getting along. You see, 
I mean, isn't that the basic understanding of unity? Well, we just, we just need to try harder so we can get along. Totally contrary, even to the concept of unity, even though oneness defines it better to our American way of thinking or, you know, whoever, whatever foreign land is listening to this. Um, so, um, let's see, let me catch up here. Paul's life, his attitudes, the decision that he made and makes are not random, but ordered. In fact, to Paul, all is explained by the cross. But let's make it clear in Philippians, not by the cross that we preach, not by the cross of 2,000 years ago, not by the cross of uh, a finished work like a book that was finished, folded up, and sat down. Sat down. Not by that cross. The most clear definition of the cross in the book of Philippians is Christ crucified. And that's what he means throughout this book when he makes reference to the cross or to these, these things. All right. So, um, for example, he does not address the individual problems found at the church of Philippi in order to sort them out. He only points them to the cross, to Christ crucified. Because if people are having a problem, and let's just think this through. If people are having a problem in the church, let's say, or Bible school, or in your home, the way the world would approach that is the counselor would want to sit down with you and your loved one, or isn't it funny we call them your loved one, but we're having a problem? Anyway, um, we never call them your hate one. But And uh, the person that you're having a problem with, and sit down, and we're going to talk about the issues, and we're going to bring up the problem. Because you find the answer by digging around in the muck and dirt and, and uh, manure of the problem. You know. Folks, that only happens if you swallow your wedding ring or something like that. <laughs> but it don't happen in the Lord. That's not the answer. And if you'll check out, when Paul addresses a problem like in Ephesus where he's talking about marriage, he says, husband, submit to your wives, wives, da, 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 da. He goes through all the whole thing, and then finally he gets to the end. He said, but this is really a mystery. Just telling you to do that ain't it. You've got to know the mystery of the thing. There's a mystery behind everything, and that mystery is Christ in you. Colossians 1.27 says that. And so only, and Paul knows this, he, he knows He's not a, he is not a professional minister. He is not a professional minister. He is someone who has seen Jesus, someone who's seen the cross. That's what he is. As a professional minister, his approach would be, well, you know, if I can just get you to be more humble and defer to one another more, then the church would run smoothly. Well, you know, I mean, I'd like things to run smoothly. Seemed like I had brown hair last time that was happening, but nonetheless, <clears throat> nonetheless, um, that's not my goal. That is not, you know, I mean, to have things run smoothly at the expense of it not being Christ in his body, which body we are, which members we are of his body, for me would be a horrible failure, even though everybody was getting along. Oh, well, we've got, everybody gets along in our church, you know. I mean, I remember I was at a pastor's meeting and somebody told me that and I said, you know, I mean, I, I don't, I can't even remember what I said. I made some comment, but clearly, 
everyone's either totally conformed to Jesus Christ and he governs every aspect of their life, so much so that it is Jesus and there ain't nobody left in there, or that pastor just lied to me. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I've been, believe it or not, I've been to a lot of pastors' meetings over the years. And it becomes obvious very quickly that the goal of the people who have spent the time to come and the gas to get there, the goal of those people primarily, not everybody, but primarily is to look good in front of all the other pastors. Make their church, you know. Because, I mean, before they even ask you your full name, they ask you, well, how many people are you running in your church? They do, you know, because your status is based on how many people, you know. Most of you have heard my response to that. I said, well, we're we're running about 100, but we're only catching about 40. <laughs> I mean, put it on a cattle basis or something. I don't know. <clears throat> God. Um, all right. So uh, let me make sure. So we're, we're talking about the fact that he, he's not bringing up the problems. He's bringing up the answer. You can say he's bringing up the problem by bringing up the fact that um, uh, he wants them to have the same mind and don't do things from strife or don't do it through vainglory and do things in low, meaning there are problems. But that's not what he's talking about. He's describing this mind, which is Christ. He's taking them to the cross. Can you see how that's the case? He's, he's not doing And yet every minister could read it like that, and then set about to, and then completely ignore Jesus and the cross. Make verse 1 through 4 the preeminent verses instead of verses 5 through 8, or on down to 11, which is all about Jesus, and which is all about, see how he fulfilled all this at the cross? Let his mind, his attitudes be in you by making a cross out of every situation and you go to the, that cross. Well, see that, I'll be honest with you, that doesn't sound like fun to anybody but Jesus. He said, I do always those things that please my father. You know? I mean, growing up, I did always those things that just drove my father, stepfather crazy. <clears throat> All right, so, um, so he points them to the cross, but even in that, he does not point them to the cross in order to validate the fact that they are dead with Christ. Um, there's more to the sentence, but I want to make sure you understand something. Is there a place for validating that we are dead with Christ? Yes. Is it important? Yes. Is it what Paul's talking about in Philippians? No. He's assuming, he's assuming that you, did, you did, didn't just walk in the door, that you walked, that you had to pass through Romans and Galatians and Ephesians to get to his door there in Philippians. And that you got all that settled. Okay? I mean, you can get through halfway through Galatians without realizing. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet. Not I, Christ liveth in me. Okay? That should be settled. And if that's settled, guess what? If Christ lives in you, now in Philippians, he's telling you how he's going to live. I mean, he's being, he's being specific. And he's going to get real specific as, as he goes on here. So, let me finish the sentence now. But even in that, he does not point them to the cross in order to validate the fact that they are dead with Christ as much as to identify the pattern set forth by the crucified, capital, crucified at Calvary. A pattern he feels is, is to become the pattern, well, first of all, it's a pattern carried out by the crucified himself at Calvary 
and a pattern that Paul feels is to become the pattern for all life in Christ. All right. So do you think it's okay to just ignore the book of Philippians then, the meaning and what he's trying to get? And the answer would be, of course not. But the answer doesn't go the other direction either. To work hard to produce what only Christ can produce. You have to recognize what Paul, if I could describe it by a box or something, what Paul is, is defining as Christ crucified. And then you have to set your heart on it. You say, well, my heart doesn't want anything like that. But your heart does want the Lord. I mean, that's, you know, it's sort of a catch-22 because we're not constituted that way. We are constituted selfish. That's how we are. That's how we all are. We want our way. We want things our way. We want to be comfortable. We want to be happy. We want an iPod. Or an iPad, however it may be. <laughs> and, and we think that by those things, you know, if I can just have that. Well, you know, what, is, what did Jesus say in the book of Revelation? And know not that you're naked and miserable and... Well, you know, try to talk to somebody who's got enough money and some to spare with a really nice house and a nice car and a nice job, try to talk to them about their need for Jesus. And what are you going to get? I don't need Jesus. Why would I need Jesus? See, there, there's that mentality. Why would I need Jesus? Anybody ever had someone talk to you like that? I have. And the reason, and I know why they said, why do I need Jesus? Because on the TV, the preachers they hear talking about Jesus is going to give you a nice house, and he's already got one. Going to give you a nice car, and he's already got one. Going to give you a nice job, and he already got one. Going to put money in your wallet, and he's already got it. Why would I need Jesus? Because you selfishly hang on to everything for you and yours. Because you are self-focused, and because every time those poor, starving children come on TV, you turn the channel real quick. You know, thank God for remotes. You know what I'm saying? It's like, could you feed these? <laughs> Before you had to run up there, could you feed these? Okay, you got me, Lord. You know, it's too much time just to get to the knob. Okay, and you write out a check. Nowadays, it's just... <laughs> Somebody give me a remote. <clears throat> All right, my notes say, let's, exp let's expand on this a bit further. We have said that in this book of Philippians, the apostle is not simply pointing the saints to the depth of the truths of Calvary as he has done in other books of the Bible. So what is it of the cross that Paul sees here when he views Christ crucified? All right. This sentence will be maybe the most important sentence of tonight. Certainly of this class right here. To Paul, Jesus' suffering on the cross is to be interpreted as selfless giving. Okay, well, you know, we can interpret it as God dying for sinners, okay? Is there truth in that? Yeah, but first of all, God doesn't have to die for sinners. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, God, why, why would death be an option for God? And if he's God, couldn't he come up? with at least 250 billion other options? 
Anybody following that? I mean, I, I would think that God could, you know, I would think that if we sat down and we decided we're going to spend this week meditating on some different ways we could have done this without dying, especially without God dying, that we would come up with at least five good ones and, and probably, uh, you know, 500 really corny bad ones. No. To Paul, Jesus' suffering on the cross is to be interpreted as selfless giving. Because if you only see the act, then you, you see a nice person, you know, your boss taking a pay cut so you can get some more money. Well, folks, there are people that will do that. Perhaps even for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God, what does it say in Romans 5, you know? When we were yet in sin without God, ungodly. Okay, he didn't say sinful. He said ungodly. That means that they were against God. They weren't just sinning. And most of the time, the nature of selfishness is to give yourself to your own. Why? Because it's yours. Okay? Well, but God, it says, but God. And so you begin to, you begin to grasp and we're going, this is just an initial introduction into this. But you begin to grasp not just the act of the cross, not just the cost of the cross, not just the benefit to us of the cross, not just the historical reality of the cross. In Philippians, you begin to examine the very spirit of the cross, the very thing that took Jesus to the pieces of wood and made his wood more holy than the two guys beside him. All right. These verses use the, the cross strictly as an example of the kind of selflessness Jesus exhibited there and that these Philippians were to participate in this as well by taking on a mind that embraces this crucified way. All right. That's, that's important. Because he's saying, he, he's saying, I'm pointing you to the cross as an example. I want you, because there has to first be the example. And the example is also the definition. It defines Christ and, as far as Paul sees it, it defines Christianity. Amen. It defines it. We, we have formed, not we personally, but we, we the people, we the Christians, we have formed up a Christianity that sees Jesus dying on the cross as an act of salvation alone and never see it as an example from which we draw the same mind and spirit into us. Do you see the difference? It's, it's really hard to describe because you're talking about an example, and in most cases when you have an example, you see it and then you copy it. 
But in this case, he has the cross, Christ crucified, as the example and as the resource to be able to not only fulfill the example, but be, be uh, of the same spirit that did that example. So why the example? If, the, if that spirit just comes in you and does it, why have an example? What would be the point? I mean, does that make sense? I mean, you know, you draw an example on the board and then you got the living reality over here and the living reality comes into you. You don't have to look at all the A to Z on the board. Am I, am I right? Okay, but we have an example. And there are scriptures that talk about Jesus being our example, right? Okay, so what's the point of that? All right, well, I mean, trust me, I've had to think through this for a long time. I have, because, because I believe and know that Christ is the answer, not the teaching on the board, but the living person. But I would read scriptures that would talk about him being an example and stuff, and I go, now what's the point of that? You know, that's like, that's like uh, giving me a paper on how an apple tree produces apples. Or, if it could be the case, you swallow a seed and it just happens in you. you, you I mean, you see, I know that's a stretch, but I mean, it makes sense if you're weird. Um, uh, the example is there so that we do not miss the way it's going to manifest if it's really him. So that there's no way you can run from the truth because the truth is unity by oneness. The truth is selflessness. But the truth is not being selfless in yourself. But it is, and this is part of the pattern that we'll get into in this chapter, that, that is the example. The pattern that we're going to study is the example so that we, we can know the running board upon which we're going to be able to take off and fly. Now, the problem within modern day Christianity is, is that we've looked at the example of Jesus and at best tried to do it ourselves. Which does what? It forms religion instead of life. Religion. Just being religious. However, Many have looked at Jesus and ignored the example and lived, shall I say it like this, a modern day Christian life. Nothing like Christ crucified. Nothing like it. Nothing in any way, shape, or form. No selflessness, no death to your rights and your benefits and your everything for someone who not only doesn't deserve it, but has done everything they could to destroy you, and that's why you're on the cross. No, that's not why you're on the cross. You're on the cross because you willingly chose. And, and Jesus said that. My Father has giving, given me, I forget the word, option, or command, he's given me a commandment that I can either lay down my life or I can take it again. So, Jesus was not murdered. We get murdered. We're the ones who get raped and murdered and da 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 and all these horrible things and get traumatized from it and all this stuff. And you know I'm not talking about because if you get murdered, you're not going to be here. So. Same goes for rape. We're using it as a picture in the spirit of the, the travesties that you experience at the hands of others. Well, we, 
you know, we, we don't see that as an altar. We see it as a miscarriage of justice. We don't see our enemies and, and therefore go into the cross or go into the altar as a way to love our enemies. We see that if we give in to that, that they're going to think they won. And we don't want them to think they won. We want them to know we're of God. And that's, that was the thing with Jesus hanging on the cross, you know. If you're the son of God, come down from the cross. In other words, their philosophy of religion was, if you're really that powerful, if you're a supreme being, then you ought to be able to escape this. And the fact that you can't even push past three nails lets me know you're not a son of God. That's the absolutely opposite of God's thinking that says, you know, I won't come down from the cross because I am a son of God. For others, for these very people. You know, I remember it was my first year of salvation and I remember seeing a picture of Jesus on the cross and it was very vivid and it was... Jesus laid down on there and they drove the nails in his hands and one nail in his feet and they had a hole there and they lifted up the cross and boom, and he sat there and, and, uh, and but while he was laying on the ground they were driving in the nails Jesus was laying there and he he looked at the cross and he said as God I created the, this I created all trees and I created this tree and as they drove in the nails, I created all minerals. And I created the minerals that they formed into nails to drive into me. And as the guy was leaning over, beating it into his hand, he looked up at the guy's face and he said, I created this guy and all men. And, you know, just young and impression, impressionable as the Lord did, I saw in that picture that he gave me a tremendous reality that this wasn't, we, we look at Jesus, you know, we say he's God, but we look at him as sort of a carpenter guy instead of the guy who created, I, you know, there wouldn't be any wood to hang me on if I hadn't created. There wouldn't be any minerals to do this. You wouldn't even exist to do this to me had I not created you. And you certainly couldn't have put this wood together and then formed these nails and then hung me on this cross unless I let you do it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Unless I let you do it. And I remember, and I mean, I think that's the first, in fact it was, the first year of my salvation. And I, the Lord just gave me that picture very vivid, almost like a movie or something. And I, I remember thinking, there is some kind of depth to this whole thing. There's something holy here, and we don't see it. The only holy thing we see is we get out of trouble. We don't go to hell. And... And I, I asked Ben, you know, help me to see this. Because at the time, I could, it was like reaching into a, a black hole or something that was so, my little arms just reached this far. And it was like, this thing is so deep, I can't even fathom what I'm seeing and what I'm in the midst of. But now by Philippians and by Paul trying to explain this, I, I have a better view of exactly what's going on here, what Jesus did. <clears throat> so, so what is it of the cross that, well, let's see. These verses use the cross strictly as an example of the kind of selflessness Jesus, Jesus exhibited there at the cross and that these Philippians were to participate in this as well by taking on a mind that, that, embraces, that embraces this crucified way. Now, 
I wrote that, don't mean anything. I can sit here and read something I wrote or somebody that you admire, a great writer of years past that's already died, maybe died for the sake of the kingdom of God. <clears throat> but God used Paul like this ink pen. Paul was just that. He was God's ink pen to write this down. And God's hand with stroke of that pen is showing us that this cross is the definition and I, I've got it written in here somewhere. It's the definition of God. And it is the definition of the Christian experience. Of the Christian experience. What should be the Christian experience. All right. So let me read a little more. How much time we got on there? Twelve minutes. Um... Uh, that these Philippians were to participate in this as well by taking on a mind that embraces this crucified way. Chris, I'm glad you're here. Um, I'm sorry, Fellowship Sunday, I didn't get a chance to turn around and really give you a proper hug. So I, I missed out. I just wanted you to know. Okay. <clears throat> Um, it's one thing to explain the cross. It's one thing, for, like Paul, to take that pen, which Paul was his pen, and, and take Paul and write out the book of Philippians and to uh, give us a picture of Jesus going to the cross and, of, uh, and, and setting that in an atmosphere of look not only on your own things but the things of others and, and be of this spirit and, and uh, this love and, and have this mind and be of one accord like this and don't do anything out of your selfish motivations. It's one thing for him to use Paul and paint that sort of picture with Jesus. It's quite another for him in verse 5 to say let this mind be in you. Because that is what he's saying right here. He's saying, embrace the mindset of Christ crucified. And uh, let's see, I wrote, in order to bring that about, they must first embrace the mindset of Christ crucified, meaning that they must acknowledge it as not only valid, because we can, we can go, okay, that's valid. It's not only valid, but as God's chosen path for his son first. Because, I mean, think about it. Think about Jesus. He came to the earth. He's, he's born. He's, he's, what, how did the angels describe it or how was it described? He is Emmanuel. God in the flesh. God. I mean, when I was first born again, people were all wanting to have an angelic visitation. Oh, I'd love to, you know, wake up one in the middle of the night and an angel be sitting at the foot of my bed. You know, y'all have heard my explanation of that. Back then, I said, <laughs> I was a couple of years in Bible school, and I said, if an angel did that, I would tell him you got a message from God. No, I just wanted to give you an angelic visitation. Well, move on. I, you know, I'd rather spend time with the Holy Spirit who's going to explain Christ to me. You know. Well, you wonder where I get that from? Paul is the one who said in Galatians, if an angel from heaven preaches, notice the emphasis for Paul wasn't visitation at all. He said, what do you got to say? Preaches any other gospel than Christ crucified, 
Let him be accursed. Dude, you're pretty harsh about this. Let him be accursed. No. He wasn't cursing an angel or anybody else. He was saying, and he says it in that book. He goes on to say in that book in Galatians that Jesus became a curse for us. He bore the curse that should have come on us. And if we don't acknowledge that, we're going to be accursed. That's, all, that's the result of, you know, listening to other junk instead of the truth. All right, let's see if I can get through this little last part here. <clears throat> um, okay, so it, 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 uh, they must first embrace the mindset of Christ crucified, meaning they must acknowledge it not only as valid, but as God's chosen path for his son and for us who claim oneness with that son. Okay, now, you can, there is, there is a theological loophole in Christianity today. That's why people like modern day Christianity instead of Bible Christianity. Because there's a theological loophole. And that theological loophole is that you can um, claim oneness with the Son without exhibiting any of his traits in you. All right. Now let's qualify that. I'm not talking about exhibiting those traits during Sunday morning church. You know, when you meet everybody, hey, how you doing? How's it going? Oh, it's going great. No, no, it's not. Your life is miserable. You just had a big argument. You know. I think we try to show those traits on Sunday morning. That's not where the Lord wants us to show them. I think Monday's a better day. Monday. As the old blues singers called it, Blue Monday. Don't make me come back there. Um, um, so, however, that is not accomplished by simply agreeing with its premise. The true way to validate this mindset is by taking it to themselves as their weapon of choice as to how they will proceed in life toward God and others. All right. I'm going to end with that, but I'm just going to say weapon of choice, I thought was good wording. You say, but you wrote that. You can't be bragging on your right. No, the Lord gave it to me, but you see, it's, we have weapons how we deal with people. Have you, ever, have you ever seen a sword fight? Have you ever seen somebody fencing? That's, you know, ch -ch 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 -ch. it's called thrust and parry. You thrust to try to stab them, and you parry to get them off of you. And whatever weapons that you can get to them best or stop them, and they might even be two different weapons, you know, a shield, you know, or whatever. Those are the weapons that we use because they work. We use what works. And we give up on much of the Lord's weapons because we're trying to use them apart from Christ. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. You know, there, there's a, another translation that says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but you are. It's the uh, RTN translation. Um, it's how, it's, it's what we're using, and, that, and it describes using carnal weapons, not God's weapon. Well, the, and I'm just trying to finish here. The weapon Jesus used to defeat the devil 
was the cross. The weapon Jesus used to defeat sin was the cross. The weapon Jesus used to, to, to defeat the old man was the cross. The weapon Jesus used to anything that you could, the world, was the cross. You go right down the line, it was his weapon of choice. It was his weapon of choice. Not a weapon that we would reach for. That would make a good, uh, uh, what is that, Temple of Doom guy? Uh, Harrison Ford, you know? You know, yeah, where you have a choice of weapons, you know? And uh, it's not the weapon, the cross is not the weapon that we would choose. But it's the one God chose for his son the one Jesus chose to be with the Father, and the one Paul chose for his life, and the one Paul chose to give to the Philippians and to everyone else. You gotta understand it beyond your head or you're gonna run from the very truth that can save you. And I'm not talking about salvation from hell, I'm talking about W the weapon you use to save yourself every day, whatever that is, or weapons. All right, let's take a break. <laughs>